Welcome to the Tales of a Red Clay Rambler podcast, featuring interviews with culture makers from around the world. This is Ben Carter. I'm going to be your host. If you'd like more information on the show, please visit our website, talesofaredclayrambler.com. Welcome back to episode 359 of the podcast. Thank you guys for tuning in. Today on the show, I talked to Mandy Kalahi, who is one of the founders of Pot Studio. This is an LA-based studio that offers classes as well as workshops specifically for artists of color. If you're interested in finding out more about Pot, you can visit their website. That's potstudiola.com. They're also doing a GoFundMe to raise money to help them get through the pandemic. In this interview, we talk a lot about the effects of the pandemic on small business, so this is a real nuts and bolts conversation. If you'd like to support their GoFundMe, you can do that at gofundme.com slash help dash pot. Before we get to that interview, I wanted to talk about a few of the new ways you can listen to this podcast. We're now available on YouTube, where you can search under Carter Pottery. All of the episodes will be uploaded within a day or so, so you can stream from there if you want. We're also a part of the larger Amazon network now, so you can listen to the podcast on Audible. We're also on your smart speakers, so if you want to say, play Tales of a Red Clay Rambler, your smart speaker will automatically play the most recent episode. As always, I appreciate your guys' support, and especially the folks that have been donating to our fall fun drive. I wanted to thank Kenley Bennett, Marjorie Levy, and Jessica Phillips for their recent contributions. If you'd like to get involved yourself, you can make a donation at talesoveredclayrambler.com slash donate. Without further ado, we'll get to the interview. Can you talk about how you first got involved with clay? Like what was your first desire to make things? Um, I first tried pottery in high school here in LA. I grew up in LA and um, in the public school system, you know, there's no wheels. There was no wheel budget. So it was all hand building. My teacher was amazing. We actually have gotten in touch recently and we're friends now. And he's super proud of pot and a huge supporter. Um, But back then, it was kind of the only teacher that allowed me to uh, express my creativity. Um, And yeah, we did a lot of hand building. All we had was clay, rolling pins, and the tables. And we were required to bring dishes and forks and everything from home and kind of use those as molds or use our forks as, you know, to score things. We did everything with what we have. I actually found out from him that Now, he told me that back then, and this was, I'm 35 now, so this was about 98, um, his whole budget for the whole year for clay glazes and supplies was $1,000. Oh, wow. Everything. Yeah. (laughs) So that's what we made do with. So I really fell in love with hand building. Um, You know, I made a, uh, we had to present our pieces to the class and explain what we made. And I made a bong and then I presented it to the class as a double candle holder. (laughs) And he just started pointing and laughing at me and he couldn't stop laughing. And he was like, oh, you think I really believe that? (laughs) And then, but like the fact that I didn't, honestly didn't get in trouble. Like afterwards he was like, I can't believe you made that and got that through the kiln. But he was like, that was actually really good slab construction. And it was like thoughtful design. (laughs) And like, as long as you don't make these things again, you really should keep doing these things. Um, So it was kind of like that attitude where I was like, oh, pottery can be like badass and fun and appeal to that like young rebel in me was had it had sparked something since then. Um, And then I just always touched base with it as a hobby. And over time was always looking for a studio that more fit me that I could just be a member at or just work out of. I took a lot of classes, community college classes, but I definitely took breaks for sometimes years because 
I didn't really like click with the vibes of the place I was going to. In the early 2000s, what was the scene like? Like what, where could you go and actually take classes or touch clay if you wanted to? I don't really know anything other than like community colleges was what I tried. That was also, I was, you know, young in my late teens, early twenties. Um, so community colleges, college campuses, there were just like a couple, there was one studio out in Venice here. I'm sorry. I really don't remember the name, but I went and, you know, I'm this like, <laughs> you know, 19 year old, like kind of bad little kid, this little like punk Iranian little kid. And I was kind of loud and I go to these spaces and it's just like all old white people. And I just felt so awkward, you know, everything aside, it was just like awkward. That was the first experience. Um, but yeah, there wasn't a lot that I knew of, but also I did not get an art degree and I'm kind of like an outsider of the institution of art. So I'm not really familiar with all that's out there. With Pot, the studio that you have founded and run, on the website, it talks a lot about how the vibes at other studios made you f or, or made anyone that was going there feel uncomfortable. And it was not until I was reading about you guys that I thought, like, if you go into a studio and they're listening to classical music and everyone's over 60, not that classical is bad, but like it's like that even alienates me. <laughs> Yeah, totally. So I, I've never really thought about the vibe in that way. So can yeah. you talk about starting pot with a with an idea of creating an environment that had a certain quality? Yeah. So um, when I started pot, it was the intentions and the idea were honestly very simple and small. It was not this like change the world type thing. It was. I've never been to a pottery studio where I felt like there was more than one or two persons of color. Um, I've never been to a pottery studio where I felt like I fit in. Wouldn't it be cool to start a studio for people like me, like a place I wish existed? And that was it. Like, I love pottery. I love like being around people like me and that would be cool. <laughs> and I didn't think about it. And I honestly, I really thought that there were many other studios around the country like us. I just assumed. I just thought there was none in LA that I knew about. So over these years, finding out we were the only one was kind of like saddening and shocking, but also motivating because it's made us like reach out to other cities to like get the conversation started with other artists. Um, but yeah, it was just, I want to open a studio that <laughs> caters to me and do the kind of things I like. And, you know, I love to smoke weed. So I was like, I always dreamed of a pottery studio that would have like pipe and bong workshops. So I wanted to teach those. <laughs> and then, you know, we like sex. So we're like, okay, dildo workshops, fun. Um, and it was really just everything was just doing things I would like or that my friends would like. And there was no branding, no marketing. To this day, we've never put a dime in branding, marketing, sales, none of it. It's just been what we think would be fun. So when you think about starting a studio in a city like L.A., like L.A. is not cheap. How did you guys find a space or how did you as a artist come up with a business plan for actually starting a studio that other people could use? It wasn't easy. There was a lot of asking friends and family for money. There was a lot of like small loans. I had been saving up money from just I had worked um at, at that point, I was 32 and kind of had to work a lifetime of a bunch of office jobs and side hustles. You know, I was like your normal millennial that did like 50 things. Um, and so it wasn't easy. At, and I had to like get money over time. But basically, when I, I was able to find a space that wasn't super expensive relative to other spaces I was looking at, and when I was able to secure the down payment for the space, I just got it. And then I went, asked for more money. And then like, you know, I took loans out and, <laughs> and stuff and I maxed out my credit card. I got credit cards and credit cards and I maxed them out. And my credit is still so bad that like I ask our staff if they'll co-sign on a credit card for me. <laughs> like I can't even get a credit card now, <laughs> but I was very like by any means necessary. Um, and then I got the kiln and then we got like four wheels. So like we grew really slow. It was just like what we can afford. 
all the decor in there was just the records from my house, the stuff from my house. Everything that was in there was just the stuff from my house. <laughs> so um, although it would have been <laughs> nice to have more of a budget, like it was very DIY and make do. And the whole studio is also the first studio in Echo Park is just about 1200 square foot for everything, including a kiln room, restroom, back room, everything. So it was a little manageable, slightly manageable to set up. When it comes to offering classes, one of the things that you guys do in terms of, of putting your values forward is that you do slatting scale for classes and, and other workshops and things. And that is such a good idea because you're you're allowing the community to grow uh, not based on who's the richest and therefore can pay for the space. But I would imagine that's hard on the business end. So how do you work with slatting scale and make that work? <laughs> Thank you for asking. Um, it is hard and we don't make it work. It just stays <laughs> hard. <laughs> so it's not like we have some roundabout plan or way of subsidizing the money that we lose for sliding scale and free classes. But since day one, our thing has always been accessibility and make pottery accessible for people who have never felt it was accessible before, not just in vibe, but that also includes financially. And so our whole approach was just that no one gets turned away. And as word of mouth just spread, um, every now and then we'd get reached out to someone and it was a very casual, informal, and just like honest method. People would just email us and be like, hey, I wanna take a class, but I can't afford it. And I would say, okay, what can you afford? Do you want 20% off, 50% off or free? And then they choose. And if they said free, we'd give it. And we just kind of always did that. And we just hustled more and more and just worked harder to be able to um, do that. So that was it. It was just a lot of emotional labor and a lot of sitting down and being like, well, the bottom line is not our bottom line. So what's more important here? Um, but granted, as we grow, we definitely are seeking new ways to make this sustainable because, you know, we've been hit so hard by the pandemic and we're not making money like that anymore, but um, which is why we're open to like, you know, donations, et cetera. Yeah. One thing that you had written on the website or, or someone had written on the website is you have a whole section on community and, and what sort of the foundations of the community are. And you'd said, I think the phrase, it was either people over profit or community over money. Um, and that's something that I hear people talk about more and more. Like this is something that I think is starting to spread in the art centers around the U.S. This this concept that they that profit is not profit is a practical thing. Like you need to have money to go forward, but it's not the goal of the art center. Yeah, it's a part of it. Right. It's up to us, it's just a part of it. It's one element, but it's not the DNA of what we do. If you had to describe your DNA of pot, like the community in terms of who you serve, how would you describe that? I would say the DNA of our community and what we are is we are composed of brown and black people. We are mostly women. We are mostly queer. And our foundational goal was to open the doors of pottery for brown and black people and to be a space where everyone felt safe to come express themselves in a very uncensored way. And, you know, during these times, expressing yourself as a brown or black artist in an uncensored way means saying and doing things that make white people uncomfortable or saying things that make them reflect in a way that makes them uncomfortable. So people come in here and don't realize how subconsciously they do censor themselves because it does feel like in day to day that, we can't really say what we think. So that was a big part of here too, is that radical self-expression. How long into this process did you feel like, okay, this community is growing in strength, like it was working, like the plan was working? To be honest, way sooner than I thought um, about when we opened, we thought, what if no one ever comes? <laughs> like, what if these shelves are empty and we're stuck paying the lease on this studio and no one comes and we're here for whatever. Our first lease was like two years. It was short. And um, I, we were so worried. And 
gradually it trickled in and it trickled in. And by like a year and a half, we knew we needed a second space. So about by a year and a half in, we were getting the like, all your classes are sold out complaints. Everyone's saying, well, I wanted to take class with you, but it's sold out months in advance. And we were just like, whoa, <laughs> like, I don't know what to say. It was very strange, but the community is support, especially from people of color was immense. And it was like extremely moving and motivating and shocking. Um, but we pretty soon into it felt that people felt like they wanted this kind of space. Um, so it just grew very slowly and organically. But I'd say about a year and a half in, it was like, oh, wow, like we're out here. How satisfying was that to realize like, oh yeah, these classes are full every single day. Yeah, it was, it was satisfying and it was shocking and it was crazy. And it kind of felt like an out of body experience. And to this day, when they ask me if I'm Mandy from pot, I just like double take. I'm like, what? <laughs> Who? <laughs> and I'm like, oh, I shouldn't have been stoned right now. You know? <laughs> but <laughs> it's, it's still very uh, surreal. So you guys opened the second space and that is, so the first one's in Echo Park. Is the second one also? No, the second one is right in the middle of Los Angeles. You'd say it's in mid city or Jefferson Park. It's right at the corner of Jefferson and Crenshaw for those in LA who know LA, but um, it's actually closer to where some of us grew up. You know, I'm from LA from all over. It's much more central we signed the lease in February of 2020, which was the worst time Ooh. ever to sign a lease. But um, the idea was that it was much more accessible to all parts of LA. Because if you look at the map of LA, we're now right in the middle. And Echo Park is more like northeast corner. So taken, I mean, that had to be a huge leap of faith. Like, yeah, we're going to open a second. And it, the second one's larger, isn't it? The space. Yeah, it's almost triple the size. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So you signed that lease February, 2020. And in March, the U S <laughs> shuts down. <laughs> yeah. And at that point I thought we were just going to shut down for like two weeks. Remember we thought it was just going to be like till April. <laughs> and even that was a catastrophe. <laughs> I, on, when we signed the lease, it didn't seem like it was going to be a problem, but <laughs> one of the things that's come up is capacity, like LA County and actually California and other parts of the U S are limiting. Like, like for instance, in a restaurant, you can only be 50% full or in your case, I think it's 20%. Yeah. Yeah. Which that like, who can run a business on 20% capacity? That's crazy. I see that all the time. Like what business model was formed around just making 20% of your profit. It doesn't make sense. Like no small business is made to sustain this without government help. Yeah. What, what, what was that process? Like in March or April, did you realize this is going to go on for a while and you guys like that you needed to start applying for other help? Um, to be honest, I think we were like spiraling in denial that we thought we'd be open again in May. So we were actually canceling our classes and rescheduling them for May. So when it was like end of April started swinging around, that's when we had a meeting where we were like, whoa, like this could possibly be around for six months. And even that was naive, right? And that was mind blowing to us that we have to buckle up for six months. And then as September approached, it was like, whoa, this is probably through the holidays, you know? And then by the time this, like it was end of November, I was like, I'm shutting us down entirely for January, like just entirely. And so I think we like, it was extra difficult because we stayed so hopeful that it didn't kind of, we were doing this song and dance to constantly adapt. I wish we just knew, obviously everyone feels the same way. Like I wish we just knew in March that this was going to be a year, you know, but yeah, we just slowly kept adapting. Every time we felt like reality shifted, we just kept adapting and kept changing. I think that's going to be the hardest thing to explain to people in the future. You know, when they say, oh, what was it like to live in a pandemic? It, the hardest thing will be saying like, yeah, we thought it was going to be over every month. And then all of a sudden we lost two years or yeah. however long this is going to end up taking. Yeah, totally. And that every two months we had to change the plan. So it feels like reality changes 
it just keeps the, the reality around us keeps shifting. And then something that's making communicating with people and connecting difficult is that you realize other people's realities are different kind of too with how they see things, how they see where we are, where we're going, what's appropriate. So it's like even harder to just connect with people. Can you talk about communicating with your students and your community base about COVID safety and also like how you're going to change occupancy and things like that to adjust to COVID? In terms of our members, when the pandemic started, we shut down entirely, you know, memberships for a couple months. But then um, our poor members were paying us just out of support, you know, and everyone really wanted a space. So we actually scheduled out what we called like quarantines and people took shifts and made teams of like four members and they came in a few times a week with that same group and so we did the team schedule for months which worked um and now we just have like an open studio but no more than x amount of people i think it's like six or something can go in at the same time, but because of the pandemic and everything, it's pretty quiet in general. We don't have a lot of members wanting or going in at the same time. Um, in terms of opening back up slowly for small six person classes, um, I actually email directly with the students myself. And when you sign up for a class, it says you have to get a COVID test within the few days prior to class. and these are the things we're doing and it includes like smaller classes. We've distanced the, the wheels out, you know, temp checks, masks, uh, big like air filters, et cetera. But I also go back and forth with them to make sure they've gotten their tests, make sure they've gotten the results. If they can't get their tests in time or if they feel, and I let them like with no judgment, tell me if they feel like they've been out and about or this and that. And they tell me, and I'm like, no judgment. I just want to know the truth. And I refund them fully um, if they want to cancel because we're a really small team. We're like four people now. And if one of us gets sick, the whole operation can't run. So I'm really concerned about us and our team too, to not get sick. So uh, yeah, it's honestly been nice though. People are very sweet and they really appreciate like us taking the time to one-on-one -on -one email with them and go back and forth on what have you been doing? Do you work from home? This is what we've been doing. And um, like, I just started my first hand building series of the month. And I told them at the beginning, like, you're my pod. Like we have, we're just meeting, but you're my people. You're my pod. I'm staying home because of you guys. I'm, you know, I'm being careful because of you guys. And I would like the same back. And everyone was really um, put, they said they were at ease and everyone was stoked on that. So the nice thing is we attract very like sweet people who care about other people. So it's been pretty easy to navigate that in terms of with our students and members. Yeah, that sense that you have a community, like you've really built a community, really helps, I'm sure, when you have a pandemic. Because I, I, I know of other art centers that have, you know, like there are some asshole people there that just do not understand that COVID is a real thing. You know, <laughs> yeah, there are studios that are fully open, full capacity, classes, members, everything. They haven't separated them. They're making regular money. <laughs> it's like, what? Like, I know we fly under the radar in terms of like the government getting us in trouble, but like, goddamn, <laughs> like, you guys don't give a fuck. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, it's just crazy to me. I don't know how they do it <laughs> without freaking out at night. So LA has gone up and down, you know, like for a bunch of months, it was kind of okay. But for the last couple of months, it has been really bad COVID wise, like the spread, it's been a major spike there for a while. Yeah. So how, as a business owner, when you, is the city itself communicating regularly with you and saying, we're having a spike, we're asking you to shut down a little bit, or what, what's the communication like with the city government? There is zero communication from the city government to small businesses. I rely on Twitter and articles and I refresh the city websites and the CDC websites and the city of Los Angeles websites every day. I'm getting nothing in terms of notices. I have to like go out there and seek it. And I've, um, I text with a few other local business owners and we give each other updates. Um, my friend Madden, who runs a nonprofit here called Project Q, they're amazing. Um, they have been helping by just 
checking in with me and texting me to give me updates, but that's about it. Um, I feel very like out here alone on an island trying to navigate these waters. Can you talk about self-care, like how you're keeping yourself from going crazy? (laughs) Oh, why did you assume I'm not going crazy? (laughs) Um, well, I'm not going to front. I'm not super woman. Like I had to take this business on last year and it broke me. I had a, like a few mental breakdowns. Um, I have my first gray hairs. <laughs> I, I, I'm learning self-care now because at the end of this last holiday season, I had worked so much. I probably worked like 90 hours some weeks, you know, at one point I realized it was like 27 days. I had been in the studio every day for 10 plus hours, um, with not one break. And so I was like, honestly, never again. I'm not a martyr (laughs) as opposed to what people think about Middle Eastern people. (laughs) I'm not a martyr. I don't want to be. I, and if I don't love what I'm doing, none of this is going to be a successful or this community is not going to thrive if I'm miserable. So, um, in terms of self-care last year, I, I mean, weed got me through it. I do not what I, I do not know what I wouldn't have done if I couldn't at least smoke weed through all the stress. Um, I'm lucky that I love the people that I work with. So we became kind of each other's pod and like the four of us at least got to see each other in the studio and we laugh a lot and we just like clown around a lot. So, and we listen to a lot of music really loud and, um, but I'm still learning the self care thing. I'm learning to like, remember me again, (laughs) slowly, but I did take, I, we closed for two whole weeks right after Christmas, which is the first time we've done that because normally we would have just been booked with private classes and class, you know, fun events and stuff. Um, but we closed for two whole weeks and I took two weeks where I promised myself I wouldn't worry about money, even though I needed to. And it totally shifted my way of thinking um, with this new year. Yeah, I'm glad to hear that because everyone, I know this is is common with arts administrators in general, even when you're not in a pandemic, that you're always kind of riding that edge of burnout and Mm -hmm. hopefully never going over that, that line. But it's, it's hard to, well, I should speak for myself. I can't tell how stressed I am. Like it's usually my wife who's saying, I think you need some time off because you're acting like an asshole. (laughs) Oh, me too. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. I could be a real bitch. (laughs) Yeah, no, totally. I I don't realize it until later and then it like somaticizes in my body. And I'm like, wow, I, I've been nauseous for four weeks. What's up with that? You know, <laughs> or um, like, I don't realize it. I was literally just looking at my gray hairs the other day. And they were all like three inches long. And I'm like, oh, straight from 2020. <laughs> <laughs> like, I know exactly when you grew and when you came out. <laughs> um but yeah, it's, it's really hard. And also I started a new business. It was my first business. I was obsessed with it. It was my baby. Like, how could we not, I think the instinct was just to burn out and give it everything. And so I was burnt out before the pandemic. So the pandemic really just tested everything in me. So you mentioned that you guys are a team of four. Can you talk about some of the other folks and how you guys divide up sort of the jobs uh, between the two different spaces? Up until last month, we were dividing up the jobs until two spaces, but it was too difficult. It was unmanageable. So we have turned our Echo Park studio, our first studio into a members only studio, which is great. And I'm training the members there on kiln loading and um, slowly they're going to be able to just load the kilns there on a voluntary basis. And we have a couple members work trading to touch up on things, but that is to make that studio self-sufficient, which even if it doesn't make us money, as long as it doesn't lose us money and it's just sitting there and the members have a space, that's fine. Um, But at this new studio, it's me, it's Amber, who's when I started the studio, she was with me, the co-founder. It's Isabella and Ebony, our new studio manager. And pretty much, I would say, um, Amber does a bulk of the wheel teaching and the teacher training. Isabella does a bulk of the, and this is now, because everything's shifted over time. Isabella does a bulk of the hand building and she helps with production. 
Uh, Ebony is our studio manager. So Ebony is kind of like the glue that makes everything run smoothly. She does a lot of production too. Everyone does production also like in our extra time. Um, and I do everything on the business end, like everything. So I run our socials. I do our customer service, our emails, our scheduling. I run our website and our web store and take our photos and, you know, all that stuff. <laughs> But everyone works equally as much. It's just spread out. So Pot has a, a few different facets of the studio. Like you mentioned that there's production, like you guys make work and sell it as well as your classes. Can you talk about all the different facets of what you guys do and why those are important? We teach classes, which we teach a lot of series classes and then drop-in classes. And we try to make our drop-in classes as affordable as possible. Um, so that people can just try it. Um, in our classes, we also teach Spanish speaking classes, uh, which is classes taught entirely in Spanish. Um, we offer memberships and our memberships are for people with 24 seven access to our studios. Uh, we teach private classes. We do production, which is we make and sell handmade pottery. Um, we also make and sell a lot of merch too and a lot of not handmade things. Um, we do community workshops, meaning we give free workshops for like grassroots organizations or organizations who serve certain groups of people. They'll bring their people in and we'll give them a free workshop. We teach a lot of fun workshops like our pipe workshop, bong workshops, dildo workshops. Uh, we teach regular pottery workshops, like, you know, all different kinds. Um, what else do we do? That's a, that's like pretty much the core of what we do. Oh yes, and in during the pandemic, uh, we went heavier into production because that was kind of what we could do. But we also started a training program, which I'm really excited about because it you know when your community space and you're shut down, we're like, how can we serve the community? It got depressing because that was our whole point of being here. And it was like messing with our mental health. So one way we figured that we can still be giving back is like to our actual staff and our members and train people and offer people skills. So we've been training members on how to teach. I've been training people on loading the kiln. Um, and yeah, that's been pretty rewarding. So we're hoping to like really kind of put more effort into our training program and allow more people to learn so that they can get pottery jobs elsewhere at places that maybe wouldn't have hired them before. Um, Cause a lot of what we do is trying to break the opportunity cycle. So we put out a job opening, you know, we'll get a lot of, a lot of people, but we try to find someone who fits like spiritually and, you know, uh, I don't know how to say it. Like someone who just fits in a more spiritual way as opposed to just on paper, because we recognize that a lot of brown and black people, especially these kids and these youth, are not given the opportunities to work at these places. So although there have been many times where it would have behooved us to, to and it would have been easier for us to hire someone who's already got the experience, I think we went for the person with like the heart and the potential. And it's worked. I think that's one of the places that white supremacy shows up that I see in our community the most is that young white kids are given the opportunity to grow into jobs or to grow into graduate programs in ways that artists of color are not. No, they artists of color better come with all the skills and then some and have, you know, you're not allowed to be mediocre as an artist of color. Even we always describe that when we plan out our production, we're like, we don't even feel like we, we are able to just sell bowls, you know, cups. It's like, we always had to make these crazy cool things or feel like everything had to be special because we just can't be mediocre. And then the pre like we're expected to represent all our people, even though we don't want to and don't, <laughs> you know? So there's definitely not access to that room to grow. And I totally agree. Yeah. Can you talk more about how the values of 
Pod as an organization have grown over time? Because, you know, in the beginning you had an idea, but then after running this for three years, I'm sure some of that stuff has changed. So what's changed that you've grown into yourself as an organization? Wow, so much um, has changed, but it's all been so gradual and organic and tiny bit by tiny bit that it's hard to tell. But a lot of what has changed has been the intentionality that we put into letting people of color know this space is for them because we were kind of just always just open and open to everyone and you know we still are and legally have to be open to everyone <laughs> <laughs> but sometimes there would be classes where it would be just all white people and it was like okay how can we get across that like although we're here for everyone we want these spaces to be saved so um we've prioritized I mean, we've just changed the way we talk about our classes and the copy and the way we talk about ourselves. In the beginning, we were kind of just like, we're a pottery studio owned by people of color. Yay. And now it's like, this is us. This is who we're for. This is what we're doing. And we're great and nice to everyone. But we just um, want to make it more clear like that we prioritize people of color in this space. So that's really grown. I guess... I guess you could say the confidence to be unapologetically ourselves has definitely grown because we've kind of been the same people just didn't really think we had any footing to say it, you know, also due to like gatekeeping and how much kind of like rejection I got and being told it was a bad idea, niche idea, pottery for people of color. That's weird. You know, I got all that and I was just kind of made to feel like this was a, like not a good idea when I opened it. That role you as as one of the founders now has to take on of being a gatekeeper and saying like, this is actually for people of color. And if you're nice and white, that's cool. But (laughs) we still want to have these classes for people of color. Does that make you feel pressure? Or is that something you're getting more confidence in that? No, this is our environment. This is what we're creating. Um, Both. Both because one, there's, there's like legal trolls who troll businesses, you know, in this way. And um, there were people who used to run into pot and take photos and run out. And like, there's been weird, weird, yeah, and weird, weird stuff. And, you know, I'm just cognizant of the fact that we can't do anything (laughs) that's not fully legal and that's not chill. So it's been quite a challenge to figure out how to let people know, especially now that we have limited capacity, that we want this limited capacity to be reserved for people of color, but without anyone else feeling rejected and without saying no white people, because that's not what we're doing. And that's also the problem when people of color or brown and black people are like pro themselves, it's interpreted as anti-white. And that just shows how much people look at things through a white lens. Um, but you know, the, the thing is, and we always talk about this here, it's not that we want no white people. Like we have a lot of classes where there'll maybe be one or there'll maybe be two. And like, that's great. It's like, it's the ratio, you know, it's the, it's the energy, it's the, being prioritized. And I think part of centering the art community as a whole, like our bigger ceramic world around artists of color, it's, this is something we're trying. I think that the community is trying to figure out, like, is it best to support artists of color by giving workshops where there's like two scholarships, which is an idea that a lot of people have put together. But the only problem is if you then send two young black kids to somewhere to take a workshop and they're the only artists of color in that workshop, you're basically making them the token students by giving them those scholarships. And then everyone knows who has the scholarships, you know, (laughs) it's like, that's why we did the whole, I did the sliding scale. Like, I think it should be much more casual. And I get the answer to this question a lot. Like, how can we become accessible? And I'm like, honestly, I just don't think until there's people of color at the top until your managers, your teachers, you know, um, it's just not going to feel genuine. But I always made it a point that if I gave sliding scale or free class, the teachers never knew which students were which. The teachers never knew about that. They didn't need to know. Um, there was no reason to know. 
So we try to make sure that everyone is just treated and feels like the same. And you wouldn't be able to tell who was or wasn't. Yeah, I've seen some organizations really, um, really screw that up. Yeah. <laughs> and I've seen people get hurt, you know, because you're, you're basically giving financial help to the people that are the most talented, but then by tokenizing them in those situations, they're not starting with like, goodwill in the community they're starting with like angst in the community or, or, or feeling they're already feeling separate when they get there and that just doesn't work totally and it's very like othering also so it's kind of counterproductive <laughs> now as you guys went into the pandemic more and more and more and, and, it, and it became obvious that like financially this was going to be hard to pull off how did you guys start fundraising in other ways beyond just like fee for service for classes and stuff like that? Um, we opened, we previously before the pandemic were very, you know, we have that like humility that our brown moms kind of drilled into us to never ask for help and <laughs> never ask for help. And that was very us. We never asked for help. But initially we just started saying hey like if you want to donate to us you can <laughs> and donations started slowly coming in and in and then i was like wow like and then there was just a lot of moral support from our community and it was really like when i was at my lowest it was kind of what picked me up because i realized there was all these people who we have helped or touched or whose lives we have changed and that this was worth kind of fighting for so we started to learn to ask for help and realized that was going to be a huge part of our survival. So um, I set us up with fiscal sponsorship, which means that although we are a social enterprise that's for profit, that now if you donate to pot, your donation is tax deductible. So if you have a community initiative, a DEI initiative, if your business or your studio or individuals have these initiatives to donate that we could hopefully be that place that they would want to donate to. And then we slowly set up a GoFundMe for the larger community um, to donate to that too. And then we've been actively pushing that. And the goal of the GoFundMe is to Get us through six months. <laughs> and I know now it's silly after this conversation to be like, yeah, every six months, every six <laughs> months. But I've learned that I cannot think or plan more than six months ahead without wasting my own time. <laughs> and it also, this, this allows the larger community to put their money where their mouth is, you know, which I think is, is important. Um, you know, as a podcaster, I've been interviewing people about how they're practicing DEI in their in their businesses and and in their lives. But what it comes down to is that friends of mine, when we were having these early discussions, said basically you need to give money to artists of color. Like this is where your good policy meets actual financial practice. And I think the GoFundMe allows people to do that. Uh, yeah, it's been, you know, although you are correct, I don't even see it as putting money where their mouth is like I thought I would. But when it started coming in, I just see it as support. And um, we've gotten a lot of like contention or kind of being ignored by the larger, more popular, wider pottery community. So we always assumed that they just didn't like us or people didn't like us, like our vibe, whatever, um, which we just assumed would be part of it. But I'm honestly very moved and shocked at how many like white ceramicists have donated and how many white potters from around the country have been supportive or buying our merch, or raffles. Um, that's been very surprising. But the largest source of support we get, which is the most like motivating and moving and amazing is all the POC, especially the brown and black potters around America who are not in LA. They go so hard for us and they've been so supportive. And I would not have gotten through it this last year without their support cuz like they are who reminds me why we need to exist. So, it's been the ceramics community at large has been I mean totally the most supportive through all this. 
Yeah, I was just looking at the GoFundMe page, and you guys have raised over $23,000, which is amazing. Um, but it came from 357 donors, which is also even more amazing. Like, this is like a, a grassroots thing. This is not, you know, a couple rich folks pitching in, you know, sizable amounts of money. Totally. Although we would love it if some rich <laughs> folks would throw in sizable amounts of money and take the onus off of our community. And that's the goal is to find arts organizations or any philanthropists like, you know, a, a five, a five digit donation could go so far for us. Whereas for some of the, I, some of these organizations, it's not a lot, you know? Um, but yeah, it has been very grassroots, although we would love <laughs> if it could be more than that. <laughs> Well, for people that want to donate, I think it's GoFundMe.com slash help pot, I think. Is that right? I think. I'm not entirely sure. But if you go to our Instagram, which is pot underscore LA, and you hit the link in our bio, you can find the GoFundMe. You can also find a link to donate directly through our site if you want a tax deductible donation. GoFundMe donations are not tax deductible because it's through their platform. But if you go directly through our site, it is. Um, and that's all at the link in our bio and you can see our website and our store and everything there. Yeah. And I, I wanted to plug, there's a few people that have been doing some Instagram raffles. What's the Instagram account that you guys have that people can find out who, uh, who all is doing those raffles? They're honestly spread out. You can follow us and we keep just resharing them. You can go to um, Isaac Scott's page. He's been a huge supporter I love Isaac and it's, this is ceramics and he has one raffle going. There's honestly, I can't believe I'm saying this. There's like so many right now <laughs> that I can't, and people I've never met before, you know, and that's what was so moving like um, these past few weeks. And I should say that I've also been grieving these past few weeks because I lost a close family member. So it's been a little difficult for me to stay on top of sharing and promoting everything. I feel like my capacity for social media is like, has a threshold right now. But when I see these things, I like, I'm brought to tears because I can't believe it. Um, but yeah, if people just follow us, we'll keep resharing and keep posting them. <laughs> Well, I think what you guys have done in terms of me being on the East Coast and, and watching you guys from afar is that it's, you're an organization that's putting values first, and that's something that's inherently attractive. Like, the more I learn about you guys, the more I'm like, damn, this is what every everyone should be doing this. Oh, thank you. That's very nice of you to say. I don't know how to take a compliment, so next. <laughs> <laughs> Well, if people wanted to get in touch or take classes or find out more about you, how can they do that? Like, could you plug the website and social media? Yeah. So our website is www.potstudiola.com. Um, just to clarify, our name is just pot. That's us. That's our name is pot. No, even our own staff doesn't know that because pot is not available on any domains. <laughs> our Instagram is pot underscore LA. Um, LA is my hometown, so I don't mind people thinking it's Pot LA. Um, our website is potstudioLA.com. Uh, you can sign up for our newsletter on our homepage. You can read all about what we do on our community page. The most we're active on is Instagram, so you'll be the most up to date with what's going on with us there. And uh, there's a donate page directly on our website, and you'll see that there's a classes page. So you should be able to get to all of what we do from our website or our Instagram. Well, thanks for taking the time to do this. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much, Ben. I'd like to thank Mandy for taking the time to do this interview. It was nice to chat and get to know her a little better. I hope you guys will consider supporting them. You can do that a couple different ways. If you want to make a tax-deductible donation, you can do that through potstudiola.com slash donate. You can also join a large community of funders on GoFundMe that are helping them to keep their doors open for the next six months and survive this pandemic. The website for that is gofundme.com slash help dash pot. I'll be back next week with another episode. 
Thank you guys for tuning in. If you'd like more information on the artists on the show, or if you'd like more information about the workshops and events that I'll be having in the next couple months, you can follow me on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook under Carter Pottery. Another great way to support the show is to leave me a comment on iTunes. To do that, search Tales of a Red Clay Rambler under iTunes Podcasts, and you'll find a page that's linked to our show. Thank you guys for the support. <laughs>